What is happening to YouTube? It's Matt Faircloth. Thank you. Thank you for watching today. I've got some, something exciting. We are so, so, so lucky. You guys are lucky. I am lucky as well. I'm very lucky to have an individual I'm going to be bringing on to join you guys in a second. And he is the CPA for my company, for the DeRosa Group. We've been able to get him to agree on his busy schedule to join us today to have a brief conversation about how syndications and passive investments get taxed from an operator perspective, and more importantly, from a limited partner investor, right? How K1, how K1s uh, get taxed and, and how that plays into investors. So if you guys are looking for investors to join you on your investments and you're concerned about how taxes play, this guys is the conversation you want to be a part of. So, uh, so please stick around and stay till the end because you'll make sure to get my CPA Jason Dubnik's contact information so you guys can reach out to him as well. So stay till the end of this to make sure that you get that. Without further ado, let's bring in Jason Dubnik. Jason, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. So, so Jason, I've been working with you for upwards, uh, it's at least 10 years now as a CPA. CPA for the DeRosa Group when we um, were just getting started at a smaller portfolio. Uh, you've been with us all these years and I cannot thank you enough for all the time that you spent with DeRosa and in watching us grow and obviously more important than anything in spending the time to be here with us today. If you guys like to hear what Jason has to say, he's been on our YouTube channel several times talking about everything from, I think we got we talked about S-Corps uh, and I still reference that video pretty regularly because it's a complex conversation, but, uh, and I learned a lot from that video that I created with you. And that's the first one. We've done a few other ones today uh, in, in our time together. So so thanks for your contributions to YouTube as well through us. So Jason, here's what, we're, here's what we got. Here's why you're here. Here's the big why. We're in the middle of a raise right now. We're raising for a company called DeRosa Capital 11, a new acquisition, 336 units in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It's super exciting deal. And it's something we're, that Irvay and I and our whole team's really excited about. But we're getting a lot of questions from investors on, ta on taxes. Uh, as we're approaching the end of the year, and as the tax codes have changed a bit, you know, with every with all kinds of complex stuff like opportunity zones and and um, in which this property is not in, um, but bonus depreciation and and things like that, people have asked a lot on how what how investing in a syndication can affect their tax burden. So tell me in general. How does an investment in, I could say a syndication, but it's really an investment in real estate in general. How does it get taxed? Sure. So in, in a syndication or any type of, I guess, partnership when, you know, investors are coming together, uh, generally the, the, the business will file one tax return that represents all the activity that occurred for all the rental activity, including the income, the expenses, depreciation, and then each individual partner will receive a K-1 at the end of the year. And the K-1 simply just shows each partner's percentage of the net profit, losses, interest, capital gains, whatever that partner is then entitled to. And that's the only document they have to worry about for their taxes. So they do have to wait for the partnership to finish the tax return. They'll get their K-1 and they can use that K-1 to then finish up their personal tax return. So okay. So that's how the income will transfer over to their individual returns. So Jason, basically what you're, what you're saying is at the end of each year, once the business, once that operator finishes up their tax uh, uh, reporting, then they go ahead and they say, okay, of all the investors that participate in this deal, now we are going to send them to their home address or work address, the, mm -hmm. their respective individual statement that is going to show their share of that operator's income or losses for that particular property. That's correct. That's correct. That document, the K-1 document, and again, the K-1 breaks up the the income between, because because a partnership can have various different types of income. There can be ordinary income, rental income, capital gains, interest. So whatever is generated by the partnership will pass through to each owner based on their percentage of ownership. Got it. And, and so we'll, that, we'll, that, we'll, that K-1 document is all they'll, the partner will need to finish up their own return at the end of the year. A quick follow-up to that. Will the investor um, see their specific percentage? Will it tell them that this is your percentage of ownership in this particular deal? It will. It will show their percentage. So while they don't see the, you know, the totals for the company without seeing the actual full tax return, but they will actually be able to see their percentage and their percentage uh, and, and their percentage of all the income. So. Once that investor gets their K-1 and it shows their allocation of the percentage of the losses or the profits for that for that particular deal, how does that now flow specifically to that investor's tax return, be it, um, you know, uh, whatever the profession it may be, they're going to be showing their W-2, they're going to be showing capital gains off of, you know, holdings that they have in the portfolio and things like that. Understood. Understood. So, so yes, a great question there because on the K-1, like I said, there's different types of line items on the K-1. And uh, even though they all come through through one K-1, it, 
it doesn't change the nature of the type of income. So if the LLC that you're invested in generates capital gains, you receive capital gains. If it's capital losses, same for you, rental income. So the idea is on an individual tax return, there's still certain limitations and tax brackets and certain tax advantages uh, that certain types of income are subject to. So the fact that it comes through, so for example, let's say on a K-1, you can have a rental loss, you can have interest income, and you can have capital gains all in one year. So when that, okay. when those numbers come through onto an individual's tax return, they'll they'll come onto that return ex- under that same split. So you'll have interest income that gets taxed as ordinary rates. You'll have rental losses, which could potentially be subject to certain limitations. And then you'll also have capital gains that if they're long-term, would be uh, would be eligible for long-term capital gains rates. So on the K-1, like I said, it is broken down very clearly as the different types of income and activity that the individual would be receiving. One of our existing investors, I believe he's maybe even still watching right now, um, asked about, uh, we have a property in Kentucky and he wanted to know, okay, if I've got losses, in Kentucky, uh, lo- losses on my K-1, the company applies a tax return in Kentucky, of course. So direct the capital 10 in that case, applies a tax return in the state. Thrust Capital 11 would apply a return in North Carolina. So we apply a state and a federal return. Do investors have to apply, a individual investors have to then apply their K-1 in the state? Yes, that's actually that's actually a great question. So be, wherever the LLC is invested in is going to generate an income or a loss in that mm-hmm. state. And then that yep. passes through each individual, regardless of where they live. So in your in your example there, if you've got, if you're investing in an LLC that's based out of Kentucky, they will receive a Kentucky K-1 as well. So every LLC will get a federal K-1 as well as a state K-1. So mm-hmm. in your example with Kentucky, if there is a loss on the Kentucky K-1, then generally that it won't create any income to that taxpayer in Kentucky if they don't have any other income in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, in some cases, there are losses that you will be able to take advantage of going forward. So in some cases, you may want to file that Kentucky return just to claim the loss. In some cases, you don't have to do it. Um, but if it is another state that you normally don't file taxes in, it's only in the case where you have income on that K-1 that you'd have to worry about paying taxes to that state. What about when we sell the property years down the road, we go to sell the real estate and and, and, and investors not filed and not, you know, not claim those losses. And then we go and sell. This is a major gain that the company, mm-hmm. and then it's a pass through entity, so it passes down to the investors. The investors now shall a major gain in that state. Does the investor owe the state of Kentucky that check or does the company yeah, pay it on? Good. Well, so I, I apologize there. It, yeah, yes. And the in most states will require an LLC that has non-resident partners to make a payment to the state on the partner's behalf. And it's mm. actually for that exact reason where, you know, for example, the state of Kentucky does not want to go chasing 30 individual taxpayers that are not residents. Not <laughs> file a Kentucky yeah. tax return, you know, for their portion. So they would require the partnership to make a payment on behalf of all the partners. And then those partners would still file their own Kentucky tax return, but they'd be able to take credit for the taxes that have already been paid on their behalf by the partnership. Now, they may be entitled to a refund. I guess in some cases, they could also maybe still have a little bit of a shortage of tax due, but generally that doesn't happen. Usually the LLC is required to pay in taxes at a high enough rate to cover their liability. So in most cases, the taxpayer will not owe anything else and may actually be entitled to a refund. Now, uh, to your other question there about if if a taxpayer had losses over the years prior to the year of the sale, they may, and again, every state is different. So we do have to look at it state by state, but some cases those losses can carry forward on your personal tax return for that state. And then eventually when the year of the sale, you might be entitled to use those old losses. Mm. Against okay. that future income. Again, every state is different. Some states will recognize what's considered an NOL, a net operating loss from previous years, and some states do not. They'll they'll dismiss it if you don't have any income from that state in that year. Okay, so it goes state by state. And then, talking about losses takes us to the the biggest loss that real estate has, and the biggest uh, the biggest thing that that real that I, what I find to be the beauty of owning real estate long term is the passive losses associated with depreciation. Um, and, and that meaning, uh, you know, I, I, I get, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll try and explain it, but I'll let you explain it. What is depreciation and how does it operate in owning real estate through an LLC? Sure. 
Sure. So, so as, as as opposed to all the other regular expenses that we're all aware of, obviously, as rental income gets collected, that's income that gets taxed each year. As far as any other operating expenses like insurance, repairs, uh, utilities, all those things get deducted fully each year. So there's really no no confusion there. But depreciation is 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 the extra large expense that I guess there's a lot more complication comes along with them. So essentially, depreciation is is the opportunity to write off the purchase of the actual building. So for an example, if you buy a building for a million dollars, you don't get to write that all off in one year. The IRS has rules of how quickly or how slowly rather you have to spread out that purchase. So residential real estate, all residential real estate is depreciated over 27 and a half years. Commercial real estate is 39 years. So it's a very long time. And that's it's the same depreciation schedule regardless of how you purchase that property. Whether you paid a million dollars of cash to buy it, or you paid no, or you put nothing down and financed the entire amount, your depreciation will be exactly the same under both scenarios. So what depreciation does create is it creates what's considered kind of a phantom expense, where there's no money actually coming out of pocket for that expense, but you do get to claim this depreciation deduction each year on your tax return. And what it can do in certain cases is, let's say you might be receiving a distribution from a from a partnership, but because of that extra depreciation deduction that you're receiving, it basically offsets it on, on the tax return. So essentially, you're almost receiving a distribution, but your K-1 is not showing any profit. So it's kind of a, that's, that's, that's a win-win scenario in, with rental real estate where you're getting a nice phantom deduction from depreciation, but you're still receiving an actual distribution from the company and just not paying taxes on it. So Jason, we don't want our investors to freak out when they get their <laughs> and it shows a loss and they're yeah. like, yeah, what happened? You told me we we're going to be cash flowing in the first year and I'm showing a loss to your market. What's going on? Yeah. And we're saying that's a good thing. Basically yeah. is what you're telling us. You want to see that loss so you can yeah. post it against your income when you file your taxes. Absolutely, absolutely. And like I said, that depreciation again, it does, it won't specifically, you know, show it on the actual K one that a taxpayer receives, saying here is the amount of depreciation you received. I mean, the, the partnership can provide that information certainly, but it won't be listed on the tax term. You'll just see a, a negative number for rental income. And again, right. like you said, you might be getting scared, saying, "Hey, is this business losing money?" In fact, it may be cash flow positive, but for tax purposes, it could be showing a loss because of that depreciation deduction, which is that, again, that phantom deduction where there's no cash actually being lost, but you're getting, from a tax standpoint, you're getting to show a loss on your return. So to add to depreciation, you said, you know, typical 27 and a half years or longer for a commercial. Um, for apartment complexes, we've been doing it over 27 and a half years, I believe, correct? Because it's you know, residential, just really big. Residential, right. Right. Um, so, the, so the, that's the, that method, and then we've been able to throw a little bit of uh, a little bit of gasoline on the awesome fire of, of uh, depreciation uh, through a method called cost segregation analysis. Um, you know, sounds complicated. It is complicated. Um, but uh, in, in a nutshell, what is it, and why do invest? Why should investors be concerned or excited that we're doing cost seg on properties like Dorosa Capital Eleven? So cost segregation is actually it's just a way of kind of supercharging your depreciation and accelerating how quickly you can take that those deductions. So a cost segregation study is done by an engineer, and uh, what they essentially do is they will take the value of the property, they take the purchase price of this property, which again in my example, let's say a million dollars, which ordinarily we would consider to be all depreciated over 27 and a half years. What they will do is they will take that million dollar property and break it down into little pieces to figure out how much of that million dollars is actually the property versus what the IRS is con considers personal property. Personal property are things like electrical wiring, carpeting, curtains, it could be shrubbery, it could be basically anything that's not the actual built structure of the building. And anything that can be considered to be personal property can. Uh, can shorten its life for depreciation purposes from 27 and a half years down to either five, seven, or 15. So there's different buckets it can fall into. And if it gets shortened into those time periods, so one, you've just now, uh, you know, taken, again, let's say you can break out of that million dollars. If you could take a hundred thousand of it and break it up into those smaller buckets, you've significantly uh, uh, accelerated how quickly you can take that depreciation. So just to be clear, you're not creating new deductions. You're just speeding it up a lot. And 
in, you know, in some cases that, you know, it may not seem significant, but again, let's be honest, 27 and a half years is a very, very long time to depreciate a property. And chances are, you may not even be involved with that property for 27 and a half years. But if you can get a nice depreciation deduction over the next five years, seven years, so on, you know, you get the tax savings today rather than having to wait a lot longer. So, so if our investors were going to be freaked out by seeing depreciation, they'd be doubly freaked out by seeing cost segregation. Because that's right. going to be even a bigger loss on their K-1s, right? So we're telling, again, calm down, relax. You show, We're even showing a bigger loss on your, on your K-1s here because not only have we taken the benefit of depreciation, but we've also taken the benefit of cost segregation because, again, this is all legal. The IRS has allowed real estate operators to do this. Um, and I think there's even been even a, a, a bigger benefit to them with the most recent tax laws that were passed a couple of years ago in regards to how much cost segregation could be brought mm -hmm. forward. At the end of the day, even a better situation for the uh, tax applications for our investors, real estate investors. We already talked about supercharging. Now we're talking about supercharging it even more. So yeah. what you're referring to is called bonus depreciation. So bonus oh, yeah. depreciation is a, um, it, it's an opportunity that, again, it's not, it's, it's it's not always part of law, but it it does change year after year, and 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 the IRS can change how much is eligible each year, and it, it can go away at some points as well. But as of right now, there is something called bonus depreciation, which allows you to take those shorter term assets that we just described, the five year, seven year, or fifteen year assets, and actually take the entire depreciation in year one. Wow. So. Instead of even having to wait five years, seven years, you can take it all in year one. And like you said, that might turn a small loss into a monstrous loss, you know, for that first year. Now, I will say, it, you know, just because you have that opportunity to claim the bonus depreciation, you, you may not necessarily want to claim it um, just because you're eligible, because it does create some other potential situations where are you creating too big, of a, too big of a loss that maybe you can't use and it doesn't make any sense? Are you losing some write-offs maybe on the state side because not every state recognizes those same that same bonus depreciation that you get with the IRS? So, But it is an opportunity. It is out there. It's a great planning uh, vehicle. Uh, but again, that's just another way of kind of creating that small right. loss into a humongous loss in a particular tax year if it might help you. Why would they want a, a really large negative K-1 earn? Is, and is there a point where it gets to be so large that they can't use all of it? Yeah, yes, absolutely. And and this is definitely something that I guess needs to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis because every sure. taxpayer can be in a very different situation. But to your point there where let's say you're not a real estate professional, let's say it's yeah. a real estate is a, is, a, is a side investment for you. So you will be subject to certain limitations in that case. So if your combined, if your total other income from all of the sources, W-2s, interest, capital gains, anything else you have for the year, if it exceeds $150,000 for that tax year, you actually are not eligible to use any passive losses on your return for that year. Now, the good news is you don't lose the losses. You will never lose the losses. They will carry forward on your tax return indefinitely until you can use them. So, and if your income is over 150, you can use those losses either against other passive income. Now, passive income could be income from other rental real estate. It could be income from another investment you've made where your, you know, your, your K-1 shows a profit. So as long as it's, you know, any kind of passive income can be used against any kind of passive loss. And then also in the year that the investment gets sold, once you close out your investment, any old losses you have that are suspended related to that immediately get deducted. So you will eventually get to use those losses, but just be aware if your income does exceed $150,000, you may not get to use those losses in that tax year. Hmm. So, and then, so, so Jason, uh, don't mean to get too technical here. Now we're talking about $150,000 gross income, adjusted income, because folks obviously make, you know, mm -hmm. deductions against even their W-2 income. So, mm -hmm. Which income are you talking now? It's going to be a, it's going to be adjusted income. So it's basically it's their W twos plus their interest income. So it's before deducting mortgage interest, the property taxes, or donations, or any of those things. So it's it's that adjusted gross income number. Uh, that's what it's going to get based on. Right, 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 right. So there goes a little bit to the point. So if you if if you do not have the a profession within real estate, then that and and you're making one hundred fifty thousand dollars or more in your W two, then you would not be able to take the passive losses right. that you get from your in your K one statements um, uh, against the passive income that you may be showing um, in your tax returns from other 
you know, whether real estate investments, private equity deals. Well, well, just because, so if you do have a different, if you have a K-1 from another investment that's showing passive income, then yes, you can offset yeah. passive income versus passive losses. But yeah. if you don't have any any passive income at all, and all you have is just passive losses, then those losses would get suspended on your return and they would carry forward. You right. can't apply the passive losses to your earned income if you make over 150. Okay. Right. Now, this this investment we're doing is for accredited investors only. So accredited investors likely earn more than 200000 a year because that's that's one of the thresholds unless they qualify for net worth um, in that. So so that's one thing to remember, guys. But what the, what the good thing to remember here is that if you're in a situation where you're investing in something like this and your uh, your earned income is above 150, so you can't use those passive losses to apply to your earned income, and you, you you've already used them apply to other pass to apply to other passive income you have, and so they push down the road, correct, Jason? So they they do uh, accrue, and and you they don't go away. You can just use them at some point when you need them, correct? Um, and then when we sell the real estate, um, a lot of people have said, well, what happens when you sell? That leads me to my next question. So if someone's got all these passive losses that never got touched that are just piled up um, and, and that, so that, that all those passive losses that have piled up through the life of the investment, even up to 10 years, all those passive losses could then get applied to the gain that gets shown, obviously, when we sell. So all that depreciation recapture uh, could get washed out. Um, a lot of the, the, the depreciation benefit that they got from the cost seg segregation analysis can all get washed out, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Those losses, again, when that investment gets sold and your your um, your, your interest in that in that investment ends, any losses, any suspended losses associated with that investment immediately get deducted, regardless of what your income is that year. Yeah. So you can fully use those losses. In fact, if you have a large gain from the sale of, let's say, this particular investment, but you're still holding on to other passive losses from other investments, those can actually be used against this passive gain. Because at that point, if you have passive income, any passive loss can be used against any passive income. But like I said, even if you have no other losses, at least the losses associated with this particular investment will get fully deducted in the year that uh, your investment ends. So to your point there, Matt, if you've had, if you've had uh, large depreciation losses over the years, they will eventually, 100%, you will get to get those deductions. They don't lose them. They just, you, yeah. You they probably get to use them when it matters because that's when they're going to be getting a sizable check yeah. from the sale. Uh, and that's not going to be a major, it wouldn't be as bad of a tax event if they didn't have any losses carrying forward to use. Um, so Jason, okay. you probably, that's, what, that's something that you've seen some investors do where they'll hold off in um, those depreciation losses at the time that the property is sale, again, assuming there's a gain on sale and then take it against at the time that the property is sold. And even if there's not a gain on the sale, just once the sale once the sale occurs, any of those losses that you've been holding on to, you can take them as a deduction that year. Got so, it. Yeah, ideally you can use them against a the gain, but even if there isn't, you'd still be eligible to take it's them. Whenever you want. Yeah. Okay. Let's say the, so someone applies all the losses to the gain. There's still a gain that they have to pay taxes on. How is that gain and potential depreciation recapture? How is all that stuff taxed? I mean, are they, they paying you know capital gains tax on it? They're paying their earned income tax rate on it? Are they paying just passive income tax rate? How does that get calculated to the tax rate that they have to pay on the gain on sale after those negative K-1s they may have wash out some of that gain. When when a rental property that's been depreciated gets sold, that that gain uh, actually comes through as two different numbers. There's an actual capital gain and there's a depreciation recapture. So just as an example, let's say we're talking about a million dollar property and let's say you've depreciated 100,000 of that property over the lifetime. So you're you're down to about 900 grand. And then let's say you sell the property, for example, for $2 million. So for tax purposes, you have a gain of $1.1 million. However, that 100000 of depreciation is actually depreciation recapture. The capital gain is only the million dollars. You bought it for a million, you sold it for two million, you have a million dollar capital gain, mm. but you do have to recapture that 100000 of depreciation. So the way it works is on the K-1, there's actually going to be a separate line item that tracks the depreciation recapture. So oh. capital gains... Capital gains get taxed currently. Again, tax laws change all the time. But as of right yeah. now, long-term capital gains do get preferential tax treatment. It could be as low as 15%. In some cases, it could be 20%. Depreciation recapture is at a flat 25%. 
So it is at a slightly higher rate than capital gains. Um, and the reason for that is because over the years, when you've been deducting those losses, you've been saving at whatever your tax bracket was. Your tax bracket could have been 22%. It could have been 37%. Who knows? But the idea is that upon recapture, the IRS came up with a flat 25% rate for the depreciation recapture percentage. So just be aware of that. Depreciation recapture will be at a slightly higher rate than your capital gain. And Jason, is it safe to say, so that typically also takes place at sale when you talk about that depreciation recapture at 25%? Only at sale. Only at sale. Only at sale. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And again, in, cer in certain cases, keep in mind, let's say, you know, I, I don't know if 1031 was going to be part of this kind of, but if you do, you talk about 1031 and you're deferring the gain, you could potentially defer all of those gains as well. So it's, it's just, be, it's only in the, in the event of a taxable sale that depreciation recapture comes into play. Until then, it, it's deferred and deferred until eventually. It's until hard to do. We can mention 1031s. It's difficult to do on a syndication because for Jerusalem Capital 11, we could have upwards of 100 investors. Um, yeah. And for me to convince all 100 of them to like, hey, listen, we're going to sell this 336 unit apartment complex and we're going to take this LLC's investment and buy another thing over here and roll right. all this profit over. Because again, the LLC itself that's holding the dirt has to be the one that is the buyer of the new 1031 exchange piece of real estate. John Smith, that's one of our investors, cannot 1031 exchange his passive investment with us into another passive investment that he may have or into another piece of real estate. That's not called a light kind exchange. And I know this like a textbook because I've tried to talk you three different ways. Like, how can I figure this out, Jason? And you just can't do it. The IRS has already thought this out. You cannot take a syndication and right. 1031 it unless you take the company and make that the new buyer, which means your investors would need to agree to this, right. uh, all of them. Okay. Uh, and that, and it'd be like herding cats to get a uh, hundred investors to all agree to go buy this new asset. They would just want to get cashed out. Well, on that depreciation recapture, my guess is that the, the, the company, the LLC, us, the DeRosa group, and obviously I'm working with you, who gets to decide which K, where the K1 losses get applied. Do Because my guess is you would want to apply it to depreciation recapture first because it's higher taxed than capital gains tax would be. So can you take advantage of these K1 syndication passive losses by offsetting passive gains by laddering syndications over a period of years? I have talked to investors about this. And I'll say this in layman's terms, what, the, what I believe this person is saying is, couldn't you just you know, encourage your investors to invest in a syndication a year or one every other year. And if the syndicator is doing a cost seg, then you're going to, you're going to see a gargantuan negative K1 on an annual basis. If, if And yeah, they're, they're, they're not, that specific company is not going to show a, a negative number, a big negative one in year two anyway, but you should be on down the road into your next investment by then. So it, is that a good tax strategy to, to invest in kind of ladder syndications as you go to where you're constantly enjoying those big, you know, you know uh, bonus depreciations and also maybe seeing some sales that wash these things out too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's, a, you know, there's certainly no limit on how many different investments you can get into. And there's certainly no law, no limit on how many losses you can claim in any given year uh, that comes through these K-1s. I mean, again, that uh, as long as you're eligible to claim them. But yeah, absolutely. There's no reason why you couldn't get into a new investment. Like we talked about, just just a strategy with depreciation is you could do the, you know, the, take the bonus depreciation one year, or you could just elect to kind of choose option B, which is get a very large deduction over a few years rather than all of it just in year one. So yes, you can absolutely, you know, stagger it to get losses every year. And that's ultimately the goal here, just to receive distribution from these businesses while paying little or no taxes on those profits. Uh, so Jason, thank you so much for your time today. How do how, if people want to hear more about your firm? Uh, you've been a phenomenal resource for the DeRosa Group. I highly recommend your company. If people want to hear more about yourself and your company and all that, how do they, where do they go? Absolutely. You can just check out our website. You can uh, see all the accounts we have on board there and uh, reach out to us directly through there. And we'll be in touch with you in the, uh, send us an email at info at dubnickcpa.com. And that's uh, D-U-B-N-I-K cpa.com. So info at dubnickcpa.com. And again, the website is dubnickcpa.com. You can go there and uh, see all about us there. Check out Jason Dubnick's firm. Uh, they've been great for us. I think they'll be great for you. They understand real estate investors. If you've got a sizable portfolio, you're looking to uh, to hire a CPA to do work for They, they do medium-sized work. You know, So if you're looking for a medium-sized company to a large company to do uh, to do your CPA work, there is none better than Dubnick and Associates. I suggest you guys check them out. So Jason, thank you for being here. I really 
really appreciate you. And uh, YouTubers, uh, thank you guys for watching. Leave your comments and questions down below. We would be glad to hear from you guys. And uh, if you want to hear more about us, and this program was broadcast live and people got to ask questions live on our insiders community. If you guys want to join our insiders community, you can go ahead and pick up your handy dandy cell phone right here and text the word DeRosa, my company name, DeRosa to 66866. And you'll get a big basket of goodies for free and a invite to join insiders uh, for 24 bucks a month. You guys can join insiders and be a part of this awesome community community where you get to participate in cool live stuff like this. Thank you for watching YouTube and have a great and profitable week.